The numbers are in for the GTX 1070 Founders Edition video card. Despite being in Taipei, Taiwan this week for Computex, which is coming up in a few days, we managed to pull off a full benchmark and review of the card with all the usual FPS, thermals, and architecture analysis. Before getting to that content, all of this coverage for the first few days of Computex is brought to you by MSI and their new X99A gaming motherboards, including the Gaming Pro Carbon. Here's a specs table. First off, check the article for full detail on the GTX 1070. We've compressed it heavily to fit into a video format, but you'll get additional game tests and detail in the article. The GTX 1070 operates on the GP104 GPU from NVIDIA, starring the Pascal architecture. The reference GTX 1080 also operates on a GP104, but they're differentiated by subversioning. And the 1070 is a GP104-200, that's the important bit. The 1080 is the GP104-400. The silicon's the same, the architecture is mostly the same, but the die has been somewhat simplified on the GTX 1070 to reduce cost. The heart of the chip is still the 16 nanometer FinFET design, which operates at a slightly lower voltage than the planar process previously and exhibits less power leakage than planar. Data path optimizations are also in place for performance improvements, something we spent a few thousand words in our GTX 1080 review covering, if you're curious about that. The first major change to the 1070 is SM count. The GP104-200 GPU has 15 SMs rather than the 20 SMs on the GP104-400. Because of the SM reduction, TMUs are naturally also reduced. The 1070 operates on 120 TMUs and those can pipe 202 gigatexels per second. Core count is a firm 1920 CUDA cores operating at a boosted clock of 1683 megahertz stock. The 1070 also uses GDDR5, not 5X, and that's at eight gigabits per second with a capacity of eight gigabytes. Time to dive into the benchmarks first. I know that's what everyone wants to see right away. As always, all the methodologies defined on the website, links in the description below, along with additional game benchmarks that aren't shown here if you're curious about how we test those things. Here's a look at the temperatures for the GTX 1080 and GTX 1070 Founders Edition cards. We've also got the 1080 Hybrid on here, which is a card that we built custom from the scraps of a 980 Ti Hybrid and a desecrated 1080 reference card or Founders Edition card. The GTX 1070 operates about equal to the GTX 980 reference, hitting 53.86 Celsius delta temperature over ambient, which is a few degrees cooler than the GTX 1080 FE at 57.51 Celsius. That extra few degrees will actually help give us some extra headroom and overclocking we'll discuss later on, as you'll see in our three-part hybrid build series where we explored the temperature limitations. The Fury X sits at 36.39 Celsius, which is a bit warmer than the other liquid-cooled cards, but that's because Fury cools its VRM and memory with liquid as well, not just the GPU. The 1070 is about 6.55% cooler than the GTX 1080, entirely resultant of the die simplification. And here's a look at the thermals over time charts. This data is pulled from the same tests as the peak load temperature average and shows the test data over time. The NVIDIA Founders Edition cooler isn't particularly impressive, but it is reasonable. In the very least, the FE cooler performs about where previous reference models have performed, but as always, AIB partners will make significantly more effective coolers on their cards. The FE cooler operates with a maximum fan noise level of about 47 to 50 decibels, which is reasonable when compared to other devices. Just a reminder, these are delta values. This means we subtract ambient, so add your own ambient temperature back in when you're looking at these numbers. If your house is about 70 F, 20 Celsius, you add in 20 Celsius to these numbers, that gives you the operating temperature of the GPU in your environment. And we remove delta, we do the delta value for a few reasons, so subtracting ambient helps control for the natural variance with the HVAC system between tests, and it also obviously helps you compare on your own ambient temperature since ours is not the same as yours. So here's a brief endurance chart. This shows the frequency over time versus temperatures. As you can see, the 1070 sustains a pretty stable frequency throughout the endurance of the test. You can read more about this in the article link in the description below. Time to talk about game benchmarking now. We've got a mix of the usual OpenGL DX11 apps, but we've also got some of the new DX12 and Vulkan applications. And we're gonna start off with Doom, which is brand new from id Software and runs on OpenGL with Vulcan support coming in the immediate future. Doom is one of the few games where the GTX 1070 performs slower than the GTX 980 Ti and raw frame throughput. The two cards trade blows depending on game, and the 1070 often matches evenly or outmatches the GTX 980 Ti, the previous flagship. The GTX 980 Ti runs about 11.5% faster than the GTX 1070 and raw frame throughput at 1080p. The GTX 1080 ties with the 980 Ti only because we've hit a CPU bottleneck 
and the 1070 sits below the CPU throttle points, hitting nearly 115 FPS average with tightly timed 1% and 0.1% low frame metrics, 80.3 and 72.7 respectively. Against AMD's current high-end single GPU card, the GTX 1070 outperforms the R9 Fury X by about 8.8%, or 114.7 FPS on the 1070 versus 105 average on the Fury X. Against the 970 NVIDIA successor, the 1070 pushes an additional 12.7% frames per second. 1440p plants the GTX 1070 firmly within playable range, running above 70 FPS, and 4K begins to stress the card a little too much for a perfect fit with regard to frame times and fluidity. Moving on to the division, it appears that 1080p testing is too easy on the GTX 1070. It doesn't choke the card for frame rate until we move to higher resolutions. At 1440p, the GTX 1070 runs at about 18.4% slower than the GTX 1080 and about even with the 980 Ti. The, the 970 sits at 55.7 FPS, which is 23.7% slower in FPS than the 1070 at 1440p. 4K is a little too intense for the GTX 1070 in the division, though the 1080 has a lot less issue with it and remains the only single GPU card that can regularly handle 4K gaming at very high-ish settings. And the 1070 could play in 4K, but you'd have to drop to medium and low settings. Looking at Shadow of Mortar, the 1070 holds a strong second place following the 1080 by 17% and leading the 980 Ti by 8.3% at 1080p. That gets switched around as the resolution increases with 1440p establishing a massive lead on the $700 1080. 80, though at these frame rates it really becomes somewhat irrelevant until stepping into 4K anyway and pushes the 980 Ti and Fury X beyond the 1070. The 1070 still sits at 77 FPS, fully playable, and marks itself an easily defined improvement over the 970 at 48.7 FPS or 45% different, and it's still fairly affordable as well. Let's move on to DX12 benchmarks. So Ashes of Singularity is the first of those benchmarks. For simplicity of presentation, we've broken into a few charts with Ashes of Singularity. The first one shows DX12 versus DX11 performance. All of this data is from the Satellite Shot 2 part of the benchmark. NVIDIA's GTX 1070 Founders Edition lands in second place on the 1080p chart with 10 FPS disparity between the brand new $700 1080 and the $450 1070. That's a 14.27% delta for a couple hundred dollars. The GTX 970 runs approximately 35.17% slower in average FPS than the 1070 in DirectX 12 mode, quote unquote. And these R9 Fury X push significantly lower frame rates with DX11, something we analyzed in the 1080 review. You'll find that again below. And the Fury X eliminates the GTX 1070's lead once resolution is increased. This chart next shows the Ashes of Singularity frame times, and that's the latency between frames. This is comparing DX12 to DX11 performance gains between architectures. So you're looking at per percent delta versus the previous generation versus the previous API. And as shown, NVIDIA's move to asynchronous compute algorithms and compute preemption has assisted tremendously in its performance gains over the Maxwell generation. We'll explain compute preemption and NVIDIA async compute in our 1080 review. So if you want to learn about that, again, hit that content. The 1070 sees benefits in architectural changes to data path organization and compute preemption, ultimately yielding an additional 28.3% percent frame time improvement over DX11. This isn't quite as good as the GTX 1080's near 50% gains, but it's still pretty damn good. AMD, of course, looks about 120% gains, DX11 to 12 with the Fury X, but a lot of that is just because of AMD's tremendously low performance in DX11. Next up is Vulcan with the Talos principle. At 1440p, the GTX 1070 performance still stands above the 60 FPS mark, well above it, in fact, with 110 FPS average on Vulcan and 119 average on DX11, and even manages to hold marginally above 60 FPS performance at 4K. The 1080 performance for GTX 1070 runs 12.2% slower than the GTX 1080, 2.6% faster than the 980 Ti reference, and that's a difference that pre overclocked 980 Ti's would overcome. The last gen Maxwell GTX 970 runs about 37% slower than the 1070. We made a big deal out of overclocking on the new Pascal architecture with our GTX 1080 review, and part of that is because we tore the thing apart and threw a liquid cooler on there to see just how far we could actually push it once the thermals were accounted for. Uh, so the things that changed here, first of all, it's on Boost 3.0 now, which is a new version of NVIDIA's Boost technology, and that does change things a little bit for overclocking, including the introduction of Scan OC on EVGA Precision, which means that you'll be able to sort of semi-automatically scan for and set your overclock, including a frequency versus voltage curve. That's brand new. We don't use that, though. We do the tried and true, true sort of basic overclocking method, which 
is really just slider tuning. So you tune the core clock, memory clock, and then the voltage as necessary along with fan RPMs or just throw a liquid cooler on there. And that's how we do our overclocking for these tests. But let's look at the table with our stepping results for overclocking. This table shows our progress stepping as we tested each modification to the GPU. Our final tested result burned in with an endurance test and stayed strong at 1987 megahertz core, 4608 megahertz memory, and that's a 215 megahertz overclock on the core and 600 megahertz overclock on the memory, which only seem limited by vBIOS and voltage regulation at this point, not necessarily an uncommon thing. What you're looking at now are the performance charts for that overclock. Some games saw more than a 25% performance increase, but the range was a more reasonable 9 to 30%. GTA 5 at 4K benefited from a 12.6% gain on the 1070, with a 1080 benefiting 14.88% on the FE cooler. Mordor at 4K, a 29.9% hike at 1080p, and at 1440p, that was still 23.3% with the 1070 overclocked. Doom at 1080p moves into the 120Hz playable range with a 9.2% jaunt to 125.7 FPS average. The GP104-200 chip runs cooler by nature of its simplified die and its lower overall clock rate, but there are other things to look at too. So the 1070 trades blows with the 980 Ti, and that difference could be made up for in some cases by a pre-overclocked AIB version of the 980 Ti, so do keep that in mind. Overall, the 1070 is a good improvement over the 970 from the previous Maxwell generation, and that improvement measures about maximally, maybe 30%, but we do see a pretty good range in there depending on a lot of things like the game. But generally, you see about a 30% delta between the 970 and the 1070 until pushing into higher resolution. So 1440p is a good example of that. The 1070 creates a new emergent class of, of 1440p ready cards for uh, 60 FPS plus gaming and this is something that the 1080 did for 4k as well where it's finally exceeded 60 FPS on a single GPU with the 1080 and the 1070 does that for 1440p as for the founders edition card we're taking the same stance with this as we took with the 1080 founders edition card and that is you should wait for the AIB models so the AIB models we priced in the 350 to $450 range whereas the FE card is priced at $450 so that price difference is enough to justify the purchase of an AIB card because it's a good, a good amount different. You'll save more money, put it towards something else. The AIB cards, of course, will also be better overclockers in some regard when looking at things like heat versus noise. So if you're trying to reduce your noise levels, but also uh, overclock, that's sometimes difficult with the reference cards because the blower fan has to increase in its RPM. So that's a big thing to look at. I would suggest waiting for the AIB cards. Other than that, the 1070 is a good chip. It performs well performs where you would want it to be and if you're playing at 1440p that makes it exceptionally good because nothing really exists at this price point that can do 1440p right now so in that regard this is setting a new standard for nvidia uh, i would not buy it for 1080p you're good buying something cheaper for that because this is just overkill for 1080p in almost all instances uh, so that is our gtx 1070 review as always thank you for watching full article links in the description below for more information patreon link in the post for all video if you want to help us out directly with your contributions over time and then of course a big thanks to mike gaglione uh, Andy Burke, Keegan Gallic, Andrew Coleman, who all helped pull this thing together remotely across continents while we're in Taipei, Taiwan for Computex. So thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.